sun, sea, surf and social distancing. As Spain and other European countries open their borders to tourists, we ask, is it wise to go on holiday when our health could still be at risk? And welcome to The Travel Show, coming this week from London's Theatreland. Now, this place is a favourite with tourists from all over the world. But with many theatres and venues issuing dire warnings about their future, we'll be hearing about the work that's being done here and around the world to try and get that curtain up once again. Also, coming up on this week's show. The unique pilot project that could save our holidays. We join a dry run on the Spanish island of Mallorca. The kit that protected our health but is now polluting the French Riviera. We've got news of the heroic efforts to get rid of it. And Covid in the Caribbean. What lockdown has meant for that little piece of paradise. Well, for a change, let's start with some good news. And it looks like holidays to many parts of Europe are now back on the cards this summer. Thanks to countries like Spain, Italy, France and Greece reopening their borders to tourists from a list of designated countries. But assuming you do get to soak up that Mediterranean sun, just what kind of holiday can you expect? Recently, the Balearic Islands ran a pilot project to test Spain's new coronavirus protection measures for tourists. And we went along to see how it went. La pandemia parece que está controlada. Ahora el problema que tenemos es la economía y tenemos que empezar a facturar para ir controlando también la economía, que es muy importante también. To test their COVID-19 countermeasures, Spain invited 11,000 Germans over two weeks to fly to the Balearic Islands. The first flights arrived in mid-June. The aim? To show the world how Spain could keep tourists safe. Hello. We feel uh, very safe in the moment, so uh, it was very good organized and uh, we are happy to be here. Mucho calor. None of these arrivals were subject to the two-week quarantine that was imposed on all visitors since the beginning of Spain's state of emergency. Instead, they had their temperatures checked and were asked to hand over the contact details for their accommodation. For tourism companies here, it's all been very welcome. It's very good news that after 92 days, we're getting our first uh, arrivals back to Palma de Mallorca. Obviously, it's been a very complicated period of time, both here on the island and I think in general in the, uh, in obviously in the world. But the, the tourism is a very important part of the Spanish economy and uh, it needs to start again. The tourists were sent to a few select half-full hotels where hand sanitising, social distancing and a self-check-in system were in place. I think all the people want to have a chance to, to take a little sun and beach and maybe a little bit normality. We want to go to beaches and uh, we feel safe here. But for some people, there are still some hurdles to overcome. Because if uh, you have too many things to, to check at the airport, it will be a disaster. Yeah. Then, and what it then it takes two or three hours to, to leave the, the airport. Uh, I don't know. People like it. If tourists develop any symptoms, they'll be tested for free within 24 hours and then get results within 48 hours. La seguridad este, este año es muy importante, ¿no? es un valor ser un destino seguro y por tanto yo creo que la gente puede estar tra perfectamente tranquila en nuestras islas. Los hoteles se han adaptado a esta situación y efectivamente pues, se puede eh, disfrutar de una experiencia pues, eh, como hacía muchos años que no se podría haber disfrutado y con unos espacios pues, muchos más amplios y yo creo que es un buen momento para, para venir a nuestras islas. 
The trial was cut short when Spain opened its borders to travellers on the 21st of June. In the end, just a fraction of the German tourists expected had taken part, but officials declared it a success. There's no guarantee that the safety measures in Mallorca will be in place throughout Spain, and every traveller will have to research their destination thoroughly and weigh the health risks for themselves. You miss this so much, and the thing we most miss, like stay in the scene with everybody and with the public. It was amazing today, <laughs> so we are happy that we have uh, like a public that is with us and like cheering for us <laughs> and everything. <laughs> great but I know there are lots of people out there with reservations about flying so joining me in St James's Park in the heart of London at an appropriate distance of course are our global guru Simon Calder and Philip Allport from Norwegian. Guys how are you? Very good thank you. I've been doing some flying. Yes you have. It's not too bad. If you're one of those people who are really concerned about social distancing don't go near an aircraft this summer because you're not going to get any but if you think well probably my fellow passengers the other people I'm going to encounter are going to of course not travel if they're symptomatic or they've been told they might be infected then it's all right um, it's pretty austere kind of back to the 70s but yeah I, I think those of us determined to travel this summer will be able to get where we need to be. Yeah. You're going to have problems, of course, um, in terms of social distancing in the big resorts, but that's going to become much easier because half the people at least aren't going to be showing up. There is an enormous reluctance out there uh, for people who've perhaps got used to lockdown, they're feeling kind of safe, kind of comfortable, and the idea of suddenly going out and meeting a thousand strangers simply doesn't appeal. Yeah. And you've got this tension, of course, between well, I obviously want to preserve my health, I don't want to risk anybody else's, but I'm also desperate to see the wonders of the world and enjoy travel. Now, Philip, um, Norwegian is one of the key low-cost airlines, so you know your entire business model relies on cramming people in. So how do you keep people safe under those circumstances? Yeah, well, I mean, like all airlines, we've adopted a number of measures, so uh, cleanliness and our cleaning routines are the top one. So, the, going forward, we will be um, sanitizing all the touch points, which are armrests, tray tables, toilets. We are um, ensuring that distancing can take place on board as much as possible. So the middle seat will be assigned last on an aircraft. The families, groups, they will still be able to travel together, but individuals, if they want to sit apart, they can. And it's, it's a matter, as Simon was saying, is also people taking responsibility. Uh, if you're showing symptoms or you're due to isolate, you really should not be traveling. The airline industry as a whole is doing everything possible to make sure travel is as safe as it can be. But there will be reduced capacity. I mean, the, there are less flights actually taking place this summer and that in turn will mean less people traveling as well and i guess it's all about giving customers that peace of mind that they're being looked after if they do choose to fly well can i put a couple of points in? yeah of course the reason uh, yeah it's absolutely correct for example easyjet uh, the biggest budget airline in britain cutting 70 percent of its flights in july august september um ryanair biggest european budget airline they're cutting maybe 60 percent of flights in in july as a result of that um, of course they're trying to fill every single seat on every single flight and aviation will not be for you if you want to absolutely minimize the risk of contact um, you're going to be taking a risk and all the airlines are doing great things to try to provide reassurance but I think that's what it is it cannot be any kind of guarantee I used to clean out planes at Gatwick Airport here in London and um, you know, frankly it's a tough old business when you've had 180 people on a plane um, it's not great particularly in the time available um, for you to be able to uh, get absolutely everything perfect. So some people might say that international air travel is the reason why coronavirus spread so quickly in the first place. So let's say someone was traveling from Oslo to London, for example, and they ended up bringing and spreading the virus. Does Norwegian take responsibility for that? The social distancing measures taking place at airports are completely different to how they were back in March. I mean, most airlines more or less stopped flying 
for yeah. the last three months. And it's taken us this long to also um, liaise with the ASA, who's the European Safety Agency, to really find what methods are the best to ensure um, the best safety protocols. I mean, again, there is no guarantee, but it's a matter of people also taking the personal responsibility to be careful. Yeah, many countries are requiring everybody who comes in to fill a, what's called a passenger locator form out. And that says, here's where I've been, here's all my contact details, here's where I'm going to be, whether that's at home or your destination when you're on vacation and here's the flight I came in on and here's my seat 23F so that if somebody sadly in 22D uh, becomes symptomatic then the local health organization can get in touch and say hey you have to self-isolate for 14 days it's not perfect but it's the best we've got thanks guys right still to come on the travel show Covid, cruising and the Caribbean, how the popular resort islands are coping with lockdown. And will we ever get an encore? The offstage drama at some of the world's biggest shows. So don't go away. Now, if you're planning on going on holiday anytime soon, you'll probably be asked to wear one of these and potentially a pair of these. But how will you get rid of them afterwards? That's the question causing concern on the French Riviera, where rubbish like this is washing up on local beaches. At this time of year, the beaches along this stretch of Mediterranean coastline would usually be full of tourists enjoying Côte d'Azur's famously hot summer. But social distancing and travel restrictions have resulted in emptier beaches that are drawing locals to them for a very different reason. Operation Mer Proper are a group of divers who are trying to raise awareness of the impact COVID waste is having on local marine life. Ça a commencé par quatre masques, trois trois paires de gants, mais on savait que ça allait venir. Au début, on était des chasseurs sous-marins. On a lâché notre fusil parce qu'on voyait beaucoup de déchets autour de nous. Et euh, on a décidé de, de, de monter une association suite à un ramassage citoyen et faire aussi bien sous l'eau qu'un petit peu sur terre aussi les plages. Every year, roughly 10 million tons of plastic ends up in the ocean. The worry is that this figure will rise as the world turns to single-use plastics to combat the coronavirus pandemic. Là, à partir de la semaine dernière, on a commencé à trouver des déchets Covid. Ça, ça m'a fait un choc la première fois que j'en ai ramassé parce que je m'y attendais pas. Je me suis dit, c'est pas du tout cohérent. Le Covid tue plein de gens. Il euh, ne faut pas oublier que euh, les déchets euh, tuent euh, la nature et euh, si la nature n'est plus là, nous, euh, in fine, on ne sera plus là. Il n'y a qu'à juste regarder le nombre de, de gants, de masques jetés autour des supermarchés. Quand les gens poussent leur caddie, ils jettent, ils prennent leur masque. Vu que c'est une solution jetable, ils jettent par terre. Si vous jetez par terre, ça va dans la mer, obligatoire. Les gens ne savent pas. Ils pensent que ça va être traité comme les égouts à la maison. Ça va directement dans la mer. Alors normalement, on trouve, de, on trouve de, beaucoup de, de pneus, beaucoup de pneus, beaucoup de plastique, plastique, beaucoup de, de tissus, des déchets. En fait, tout ce que l'homme a besoin, on trouve. C'est alarmant parce qu'en fait, à chaque fois qu'il y a quelque chose de nouveau, ça finit en mer. Donc il faudrait, pour empêcher les déchets d'arriver en mer, il faudrait arrêter de les produire, diminuer tous les déchets qu'on jette. C'est-à-dire que les, les personnes ne voient pas ce qui se passe sous l'eau. Et nous, on arrive, on les sort et finalement, c'est pour mettre à vue et pour bien faire voir qu'il y a d'autres solutions. Il faut bien jeter, bien trier. On pense franchement que c'est que le début d'une future pollution. Ça ne représente même pas 1% des déchets qu'on trouve dans la mer, mais dans quelques mois, ça va devenir beaucoup plus euh, problématique. Il y en aura de plus en plus. Un peu comme les méduses, on va avoir des masques passés.
Now, it's looking like a long, hard fight back for the cruise industry when this pandemic eases. And many of us can recall those alarming pictures from earlier this year of all those passengers quarantined aboard infected luxury liners. For the Caribbean islands, this is deeply worrying. In Antigua, for example, more than half of the local jobs rely on tourism. In fact, let's go there now, where we're going to have a chat with Sean Weathered, who runs a tour company on the island. So, Sean, there's only been a few dozen infections. So would you say that this crash in tourism is as bad as the pandemic itself? Economically, everyone here is suffering. Take, for example, where I'm at right now. As it stands right now, this is one of the newly open resorts on the island. But the beach itself is absolutely empty. The only person that I see on the beach here is a security guard. That tells us that there is absolutely no employment going on in the island. So it's only a matter of time for those persons who have savings for that to run out. So we'll say that we're heading on a slope where it's going to get really slow. Yeah, of course. Now, they're currently in the process of enlarging the cruise port, aren't they? This now looks like quite an optimistic project. Would you agree? Uh, surprising to say that project has been ongoing and seemed to be flourishing because it's not government funded and private investors, that project has been going quite smoothly. So there's clearly this belief that, you know, cruise ships and the cruise industry is going to continue. Absolutely. This island has no natural resource. So we depend heavily on that industry to create an instant injection of cash into the economy. So that's what it does. It opens up persons to the island, mm -hmm. but even more so, it's like an instant injection of cash into the economy on a daily basis. So let's talk about Cruising's reputation for a minute, which has taken a little bit of a hit in recent years. You know, there are people out there who are worried about the environmental impact of these ships and all these things like over tourism. So is there an opportunity to rebuild sustainability here? I would say yes. And as for the environment, our environment is important for us into the future. But let's be more realistic and practical. This is an industry that sustains millions of lives. So I, I would not take it off the table at all. It, it's now time to, to revisit things, see how best we can, we can put measures in place so that we can go forward in a, in a more environmentally friendly uh, measure. When you do start running your own tours again, how, how are they going to be different? You know, hurricane season isn't that far off. So does that mean you might have to write off this year? Uh, we're not quite sure yet, but the government itself has put a lot of measures in place. You must be certified. Yeah. A different certification is required for persons doing tours now. That course took place about two or three weeks ago. Um, it particularly focuses on safety. A uh, minimum of persons in the vehicle, vehicles would normally carry four, can only yeah. carry two. So a lot of policies have changed on the island. Mm -hmm. just to mitigate the risk of persons contracting disease because everyone's livelihood depends on this happening. Yeah, of course. I bet people can't wait to get back into action. Me for one. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Brilliant. Sean, thank you so much. That was a great insight. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Now, one thing you almost certainly won't have done recently is buy a ticket to see a live show. It's hard to imagine what the future might be for an industry that relies on cramming hundreds of people into the same tight space to create a buzz. And in some of the most exciting cities in the world, it's been a big, important business for decades. Las Vegas, for instance, a place known for bright lights, 24-7 gambling, non-stop partying, and of course, some of the biggest shows on the planet. In 2019, 49 and a half million people visited Vegas, spending a massive $58 billion. But something tells me that in 2020, those numbers are going to be very different. Las Vegas is no stranger to adversity. The city has seen its share of ups and downs, but what I've seen in this town has just changed my perspective on how fragile our travel and tourism industry can really be. We have a lot of unknowns. What does David Copperfield do when he has to sell enough tickets to fill 80% capacity? What do the small theaters do here when they're looking at possibly 20% capacity when they do reopen? One thing's for sure though, the spirit of the people is great. People are willing to come back and vacation, but how fast they come back and to what extent they can actually go into the venues, that's gonna make a difference in whether or not shows start up soon or much, much later here in Las Vegas. 
Whilst COVID prompted the majority of theatres across the globe to close their doors, the big shows are hoping to be back by the end of the year. However, for smaller productions, the coronavirus has been a fatal blow. But it's not all bad news. Across Europe, theatres are thinking creatively while sticking to government guidelines. In Berlin, the Berliner Ensemble has taken 500 of its 700 seats out. What you see here in our audience room is what I think uh, became somehow iconic. I do believe that this is the more emotional experience for an audience to understand physically and emotionally that we are in very special times. Whilst over in Barcelona, the Gran Teatro del Liceo has reopened with an audience full of plants. For many centuries, the man, the human, has been in the center of the world, and this coronavirus has shown that the man is part of the world, but uh, the own of the world is nature. And what we have seen uh, in, in our venue is nature um, is the center of, of the art, the center of the world, and we have played for them. In the UK, things are hopefully on the up as well. London's famous West End theatres are now trying out a number of measures that might get us all back inside these historic buildings much more quickly. So while it's easy to remain socially distant outside on the street, one of the key characteristics of theatres in the West End is tight corridors. That means it's all too easy for crowds to bottleneck. A mix of improved hygiene standards, thermal imaging cameras and face masks could be the key to getting theatres open again. When theatres are back open, what safety measures are going to be put in place? It, we're, we're reviewing this and the theatre owners are looking at various different options, but it's, it's going to be about deep cleaning as it is on, on transport. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the theatre industry is in direct talks with government and, and scientists to make sure that audiences feel safe. Yeah, well, I guess ultimately that's what it's all about, isn't it? Giving audiences that peace of mind that when they come to the theatre, it, everything will be OK. Yeah. And the great thing about, you know, theatre is that there's, there's plenty of airspace above you. And, yeah. you know, you're not, you're not confined, like, say, on a, a tube train or, or, or a bus. But uh, hopefully, um, you know, people will feel safe and comfortable and, and we will do our very best to make sure that they are so. Right, well, that's it for now. We'll be back in a few weeks' time with hopefully a few more little glimmers of hope for anyone itching to get back on the road. In the meantime, we'll be bringing you some of our best bits. From a chilly train trip across Norway to some of the tastiest food experiences we've had in the last few years. Until then, keep planning your next trip. You can always dream. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.